from right. So the learning objectives today, um, one of the main things we'll be learning is reviewing uh, hydrogen bonding and its importance in biochemistry. Um, it's one of the most important factors when um, looking at protein structure and um, sec especially secondary and tertiary structure. We'll also be learning what the structure and function of the different amino acids are. That's also a very important step, knowing all 20 of the amino acids by name and their um, structure and the properties of them. Next, we'll be understanding how peptides are formed uh, through peptide bonds. Next, uh, we'll be learning the different protein purification techniques, including chromatography and its different forms, SDS page, and uh, isoelectric focusing, okay? So let's move on to the content. So first, we'll start with water and bonding. So uh, as many of you know, this is the structure of water, H2O. Water is a polar molecule with a partial positive and a partial negative end. The partial positive end is the two hydrogens and the partial negative is the oxygen. This allows water to form hydrogen bonds with itself. So hydrogen bonds are between the hydrogen of one oxygen of one water to the oxygen of another water. And each water molecule, as you can see, can have three hydrogen bonds, one with its oxygen and two with its hydrogens. So um, there are hydrogen bond donors and hydrogen bond acceptors. So hydrogen bond donors are the molecules in which the hydrogen is binding and hydrogen bond acceptors are the molecule. Oh, sorry, I can go back one side, no problem. Uh, anything, yeah, if, if you guys want me to go back or go slower, just feel free to put it in the chat and I'll. Uh, Being that okay. we may have other things doing, um, so how about we go back at the end of the lecture? I'm not sure, I'm just suggesting because other people may have other engagements right after this. How long okay. is this lecture? Um, so yeah, the, uh, these slides won't, uh, won't be emailed, but um, it will be recorded. So you can always go back and pause it. So I, I already started recording, okay? Yeah, yeah otherwise right. we'll be there. So. Yeah, so this lecture will take about one hour to an hour 30, depending on um, things, okay? Um, so like I said, hydrogen bond donors are the molecules in which the hydrogen is binding and hydrogen bond acceptors are the molecules in which hydrogen is bound to. So you can see with this diagram, so this red water molecule is the hydrogen, has a hydrogen bond donor because its hydrogen is binding to the oxygen of the other water molecule. And it's the, and the other, the blue one is the acceptor because its lone pair of electrons is binding to the uh, hydrogen. So uh, an important note, hydrogen bonds in water are not static like covalent bonds. Um, they're constantly breaking and reforming between different water molecules, which is one of the things that gives water very, uh, its unique properties over other liquids like methane, like a high boiling point. And another note, uh, static means um, the bonds are like, they don't like move or break. In water, the bond, the, this hydrogen bond between this red and blue one, it's constantly breaking and this blue one is making a new hydrogen bond with another water molecule and then that one breaks and then makes another one with a different water molecule and they're always like shifting, shuffling. They're not just like static, like a solid, or even in like in methane, where the like the bonds are just kind of like the bonds between the hydrogen and the oxygen in uh, the, the one water molecule, the um, covalent bond is static. It doesn't like move, change or anything like that. It doesn't break very often. So that's what that means. All right. Um, so like I said, um, each water molecule can be both a hydrogen bond donor and acceptor at the same time. So for example, this blue one can be a hydrogen bond acceptor with its oxygen being the acceptor, but it, the two hydrogens on it can also be hydrogen bond donors to other adjacent water molecules. Okay, so um, these are some common hydrogen bond donors and acceptors. As you can see, hydrogen bond donors are like NH2 or OH. They're ones that they're hydrogens bound to either a nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine, something electronegative, so that uh, it can uh, donate. And it has to have enough H. So like um, a ketone or an al um, a ketone or an aldehyde, it won't be able to be a hydrogen bond donor, uh, but they are good hydrogen bond acceptors. As you can see, aldehydes, uh, ethers, uh, amides, and, and ketones are very good hydrogen bond acceptors because they have uh, oxygen with two lone pairs and two bonded electrons. 
Okay. And as you can see, something like a methane or um, a benzene ring, it can't hydrogen bond even though it has hydrogens because they're not attached to an electronegative uh, atom like oxygen, fluorine, or nitrogen. Okay. Right. Uh, so what are the importance of these hydrogen bonds? Well, water is the main medium of all biochemical reactions and processes in our cells. So everything that happens in our body basically happens in water. So, and because of the thermodynamic favorability of water being able to form all of these bonds with itself, it doesn't like to be disturbed. So um, we'll learn about this later, but entropy is a big factor in thermodynamics and being able to form hydrogen bonds is very thermodynamically stable. So because of that, water doesn't like to be disturbed with something that's um, hydrophobic or has no hydrogen bond donors or acceptors, like I mentioned a benzene ring or a long carbon chain. And that's why they don't mix in water because if they were to mix in water, the water molecules wouldn't be able to hydrogen bond with themselves or with the hydrophobic molecule. So it'd be like, it would actually like clump up like a ball or a layer, if you know, like oil, it, it becomes like a layer or a fat, a piece of fat, it like clumps up into a ball when you put it in water. And that's because it wants to mitigate the kind of like the damage to one area, right? And so the rest of the water is undisturbed and can water and hydrogen bond with itself. On the other hand, molecules that are hydrophilic or they have these acceptors and donors, like I mentioned, uh, ethanol or something like that, they mix very well in water. That's because they can hydrogen bond and they can like substitute for a water molecule and that heavily mitigates the thermodynamic loss if it wasn't able to hydrogen bond, okay? So our cells must use this basic principle to their advantage when designing proteins to accomplish different tasks. Um, obviously our cells can go against like the laws of nature. So they must use this kind of as a tool to be able to carry out their different processes. For example, when you're, uh, our cells are making proteins, hydrophobic parts of the protein are found buried deep inside, while hydrophilic parts of the protein are found on the outside to interact with surrounding water. Um, so uh, Kim, to address your question, what happens if the molecules are both hydrophilic and hydrophobic, such as a lipid? I'm, I'm assuming you mean um, phospholipid bilayer well, that actually um, is something we may cover later when we cover the cell. But what happens is the hydrophilic parts will actually be on the outside covering water. And that's kind of what I was getting at um, with the proteins as well. The hydrophilic part is on the outside to interact with the water, while the hydrophobic parts are inside. Um, and they're kind of like blocked. So they don't touch water at all, whereas the outside is the one touching water. Okay. Uh, is, that, is that clear? Okay. Uh, the third one again? Okay. So uh, molecules that are hydrophobic, so they don't have hydrogen bond except, so think of a benzene ring like, um, let's see if I can go back. So like uh, this benzene ring, uh, yeah, I, I can go over this. Um, so like a benzene ring, it doesn't have any hydrogen bond donors or acceptors. So if you just put like a benzene ring in water, it won't, or like a bunch of like molecules of benzene in water, it won't, it'll be very thermodynamically unfavorable. You wouldn't want to have that. And it would like, it wouldn't be favorable for it to mix with water. It's kind of like spread out. What would, be, what would actually happen was it would like clump up in either a ball or a layer, uh, like on, separate from the water. So it wouldn't like mix. Um, so I, if you ever did this before, if you pour oil, which is like a hydrocarbon, it, ha it has no, um, not really many oxygen or nitrogen or fluorines, it becomes like a layer on the water, it doesn't actually like mix well. So this is because it limits the, the kind of unfavorable interactions. Because if you put, if it was to mix, then each water molecule wouldn't be able to have the maximum number of hydrogen bonds with other water molecules. So in instead of this red, um, hydrogen bond donor, it would be a benzene ring, which would have no interaction with this blue water molecule, if you can imagine that, okay? Because of that, um, the, it, you would lose a lot of the energy and the thermodynamic favorability of like the shifting hydrogen bonds, and it would disrupt the system, which doesn't happen in nature. Uh, however, if you have something um, 
that's hydrophilic, like an ethanol which has an OH, or any of these hydrogen bond donors like the, this one right here, the NH2, it would be able to act as a hydrogen bond donor and it wouldn't disrupt the formation of uh, constantly shifting hydrogen bonds that water normally has. So basically water has a certain thermodynamic favorability. If you put something hydrophobic in it and it was to, it was to mix, it would greatly lower the thermodynamic favorability, which the nature doesn't want. However, if you put something hydrophilic, it wouldn't limit it as badly. Okay. Uh, is that clear or should I explain it in a little bit better of a way? Okay. Um, we'll, we'll come back to this because this is a topic that gets covered in multiple different like uh, topics and lectures because this is hydrogen bonding is very important in all of nature. All right. um, so moving on to amino acids, this is the main thing of biochemistry. Um, so what is an amino acid? Well, uh, amino acids, all, all of the amino acids have this exact same basic structure um, as the one, this picture on the left. So it has an alpha carbon in the middle, which is black carbon. It has an amino group on one end, uh, with the, which is this NH2. It has a carboxyl group on the other end, which is this C uh, bond OH. has a hydrogen bound to it. And the fourth bond is an R group side chain. So the only change between the 20 amino acids is the R group. This is the only thing between them that is different. And if you can see on the right, there's a dipeptide. So it's glycine and alanine, which are two different amino acids. Um, so as you can see, this glycine, it has this, um, has the alpha carbon in the middle. One end is attached to an NH2 amino group. One end is a hydrogen. Another end is the C double bond O, except it's a little bit modified. Um, it's, it's alpha because it's next, yeah, uh, it's, it's alpha because it's, um, it's the first one next to the functional group, yes. So the only other carbon would be this carboxyl carbon, but this one, it doesn't count as um, alpha carbon because it's, it is part of a functional group, yeah. So this alpha carbon in the middle is the only one that's next to a functional group. Okay. And for glycine, the R group is an H, so you can see on the bottom here, it's just an H. Sim similar with al alanine, has um, alpha carbon, carboxyl group, amino group, and H on top, and the, the R group is uh, CH3. So amino acids are the basic building blocks of all proteins. So they link together in a long chain to produce a polypeptide or protein. So how do they do this? Well, um, they have, so they do make something called a peptide bond, right? And pep in a peptide bond, the amino and NH uh, group of one amino acid attacks the carboxylic, um, attacks the carboxylic COOH end of the other, forming a CN bond called a peptide bond. So this releases water in a reaction called a dehydration reaction, um, as you can see. So you have one amino acid right here, and it has C double bond O, OH, and this one has the amino group NH2. When they combine the C and the N to form a covalent bond called the peptide bond, the OH of this one in pink and the H of, of uh, the amino group in, eight in um, also in pink, they actually come out to make room on the C and the N so they can have an extra bond because you can't break the uh, bonding rule. They come, the water comes out and you make a peptide bond. And because water comes out, the molecule becomes dehydrated. So you, you're losing water, the molecule loses water. And that's why it's called a dehydration reaction. And this is also reversible. So you, if you add in water and a uh, proper enzyme like a nuclease, you can actually uh, break peptide bonds. Or I mean, uh, yeah, a protease, not a nuclease, my bad. Uh, you, you have a protease that can break, um, that if you add water, it can break it and it's called a hydrolysis reaction. By adding water and um, an enzyme, you can break it and into separate amino acids. Or if you um, remove water from these two molecules, can form peptide bond, right? And you, if you can imagine all the, pep, all the multiple peptide bonds formed between different amino acids and you get a long linear chain. On one end of the chain, you still have a free amino uh, end like this on the left of the peptide. And you have um, a C dub, uh, dub bond o, OH on the right called the C terminus. One side is called the N terminus, the other call, side is called the C terminus. Um, the structure of a peptide in just n normal, like um, 
it's standard to, oh, sorry, I'm sorry, uh, she missed a couple of chats. Um, hey, Mark. Um, I, yeah, I could, I could handle the chat um, if, you, if you want. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, okay, so uh, I'll answer a few of the chat questions once I finish this thought, okay? Sounds good. All right, so like I was saying, um, normal like nomenclature is just like in DNA or RNA where you always write from left to right five prime to three prime end, in proteins or in a long polypeptide chain, you would always write N-terminus to C-terminus. So if you have six amino acids in, in a polypeptide, the leftmost one would be the N-terminus if you're writing it down on paper. The leftmost one would be N-terminus, the rightmost one would be C-terminus, unless, it, unless it's specified otherwise, okay? Now, uh, let me see if I can open up the chat as well. Okay. So I saw this question here. Uh, as a note, I mean, you do have to memorize all of the amino acids for the MCAT, highly recommended. I will um, go over that in a short while. Um, how do you notice that we have two amino acids here? Well, firstly, you see, uh, you know the structure of amino acids. So it's an alpha carbon, amino and carboxyl and an R group, right? Well, in this uh, molecule, you see there's one, uh, two alpha carbons. Each of them has an amino end, um, a carboxyl end, an H, and one R group. The other way to know that you have two is that there is a peptide bond. So between the C and N, it's just a normal covalent bond between a carbon and nitrogen, but it just has a special name called a peptide bond. You can see if you have one peptide bond, so it's like one link connecting two different things. So you can always count the number of peptide bonds that you see and just add one, and that's the number of amino acids that there are in the polypeptide. Okay. Uh, let's see. So the difference between the carboxy, uh, between the C and N terminuses are one end is, so if you can see here on this dipeptide, one end is a free nitrogen, like the, the amino group NH2 is on one end, and the C double bond OOH is on the other end. Normally these combine to make a peptide bond, but if you have a linear thing, a linear like line, one end will be unbound on the nitrogen and the other end will be unbound on the carbon. Unless you form like a ring, like a circle, they won't ever, you'll always have one end no matter how many amino acids and applied peptide you have. And the difference is on one end, on the leftmost end in proper nomenclature, um, it's an NH2. On the right end, it's a C double bond OH. So this, NH, this amino group on one end is the N terminus the C double bond o, OH is the C terminus always. Okay. Um, yes, okay. So like I mentioned, um, memorize the amino acids, very important. Um, but before we get started on that, I want to see if we can do a poll question. So let me see if this, oh, um, Sorry, actually, Tim, because we're both logged into onto the same account, I can't uh, start the poll. It says you're logged in from another device. Your polling session is inactive. Um, okay, just, um, okay. So during this lecture, I'm gonna have multiple MCAT style questions um, pu pulled up. These I found either online or in other MCAT um, resource books, so they're, should be fairly similar to something you would actually see on the MCAT. Most of these aren't ones that I just made up, okay? So really take your time reading this and make sure you understand it, okay? Oh, okay, so the difference between uh, hydrogen bond and peptide bond, I'll, get, I'll go through that once, I, once we finish this question. Uh, see if you can answer this question first, okay? Uh, just write it down on paper because um, you don't, you don't have to message me, just uh, write it down paper. The polling doesn't work. Normally I would have polls. I'll try and fix that for next lecture. Okay, so just write it down on paper in your head, and, okay? And let me see. Um, and either put like a raise your hand or put a check mark um, Next your name if you are finished, so I, just so I know, okay?
Okay, I'll give a couple more minutes just so everyone can finish up. Okay, um, does anybody want more time? Just put in chat if anybody wants more time. Okay, all right. So the correct answer is D. And so we can go through this um, one at a time because it's not pulling. I can't see how many of you pick which answer. Um, but we can just go through these one at a time. So it says which of these uh, statements concerning peptide bonds is false. So um, so get A, their formation involves a reaction between an amino group and a carboxyl group. Um, as I mentioned, one, one carboxyl group from one and the amino group from another form peptide bond. That's the, that's the very basis. So it can't be that one. They are the primary bonds that hold amino acids together. So as I mentioned, uh, an, um, an amino acid, um, a polypeptide is formed of multiple amino acids. And if you want to think of polypeptides as like a long chain, then um, peptide bonds are the link that holds the different parts of the chain together. And having more, pep having more peptide bonds increases um, the length of the chain between different amino acids. So B would be in, um, not the right answer as well. So C, they have partial double bond character. So I actually didn't cover this uh, because this is kind of an organic chemistry uh, topic with resonance structure. This is not something we'll be learning at uh, today, but I will go over it in a second. But even without knowing that, um, you would know that D, you could know that D was the correct answer um, because as I mentioned, uh, forming a peptide bond is called a dehydration reaction because water actually comes out an OH from the carboxy end and an H from the uh, amino end come, uh, come out and you get, they form water. Since you're losing water, that's a dehydration reaction, not a hydration reaction. Okay, and let me go over C as well. Let me go over C as well. They have partial double bond character. So if you can see on the bottom right here, there's a peptide bond. So you see how um, the C double bond O um, can actually have a resonance structure. If you guys know, remember that from again chemistry. Um, it can actually have a resonance structure where the double bond actually moves off of the CO and actually goes on to the CN, to the, to the peptide bond. It's not as favorable because um, the nitrogen will be positive and the oxygen will be negative, but it is a possible resonance structure. And so um, the CN bond, it has some partial double, double bond character. It's not fully single bond. Okay, and this is important, but this will be covered more. You, you'll understand this better when we cover organic chemistry as well. Uh, when we cover uh, resonance structures between double bonds. Okay. Oh, uh, resonance structures, like um, they resonate. Like I met, like I said, I don't really want to get too far into that because that's an organic chemistry topic. It's not um, a biochemistry topic or amino acid topic. Um, it's uh, organic chemistry topic. And when we cover organic chemistry, you'll understand this better, okay? But um, the main thing uh, is that Peptide bonds do have partial double bond character, so you, you should remember that. And a hint just for the MCAT, when, whenever you see an answer choice and you don't know what it means, so like if you didn't know C, what partial double bond character means, try and see if any of the other answers you can narrow down is right. So you, sh you would have been able to know that D was false because it's a dehydration reaction rather than a hydration reactions so it didn't matter if you knew C or not, if you were confident that you knew D and you could have picked that as the answer. So on the MCAT, you likely won't know all of the answer choices for all of the questions. So you have to use a little bit of kind of guessing and kind of seeing how confident you are in what you do actually do know, okay, to get the right answer. Yeah, uh, yes, and Opal is correct. Resonance similar to conjugation or double bond Alternating, yes. And to go back to a previous question, difference between a peptide bond and a hydrogen bond. One, hydrogen bonds are between only between a hydrogen and either an oxygen, nitrogen, or fluorine. 
whereas peptide bonds are always between a carbon and, and a nitrogen. Uh, peptide bonds are covalent bonds, which are very strong, while hydrogen bonds are uh, very, very weak, and they can easily break or reform, whereas covalent bonds are much, much harder to break. Um, uh, peptide bonds only occur between the C-terminus and the N-terminus of, of two different amino acids uh, to combine them, whereas hydrogen bonds occur between many different things like water, ethanol, really anything that has um, any ketones or um, NH2s or anything like that. And you'll notice that um, peptides also have um, hydrogen bonding between themselves because as you can see, they have an NH2, which is a donor and a dub bond O, which is an acceptor, which is a secondary structure, which we'll cover at a different time, but uh, peptides do hydrogen bond with themselves as well. Okay. So next up, what are the R groups? So this is like one of the key topics of amino acids. So like I mentioned, there are 20 different amino acids with the only difference between them being the R group attached to the alpha carbon. So these R groups have very different properties from each other and they serve very different functions in the amino acid. Here's a chart. I would recommend taking a picture of this if you don't already know it. This has the 20 different amino acids. I know it says 21 at the top. The 21st one is this one, selenocysteine. This one is very rare. I've never seen this on an MCAT or in an undergraduate biochemistry course or anything. Um, I think, uh, so it's like a special amino acid. Um, so you don't really have to be too worried about it, but the other 20 you should definitely uh, memorize and uh, PKAs are very important to memorize. So let me go over what you should memorize. Firstly, you should memorize um, the group each amino acid belongs to. So for example, these three are positively charged. As you can see, they all have a positive, positive, positive. These two are negatively charged. They have a negative and negative. These are polar, meaning that they have an OH or an NH2 or a dub bond O, but they're not charged like these guys. So these four and these are all hydrophobic, meaning that they all have um, either just hydrocarbons or very bulky uh, side chains. Like for example, um, this one phenylalanine has a big benzene ring or this one tyrosine, even though it has an OH, which you would think would make it polar, but because the benzene is so big and hydrophobic that it kind of overpowers um, the one OH, it's not enough, okay? Um, yes, I do have some tips, for, well, there are tips in that um, how to help memorize them. I would highly recommend flashcards. Firstly, that's how I memorize them. So I had um, the full name on one end of the flashcard. And on the other end, I had the three letter code, which is right here under the full name, the one letter code, which is in this red uh, circle. Um, and um, the, the R group structure as well as which, um, if they have a PK, which these top, this top line, the positive and negative ones do. As you can see, they have PK, so arginine has a PK next to its NH2 positive group. Uh, so it has a PK of 12, so I'd remember that. Um, and I'd remember the PK of, if you notice, all of the C terminuses and N terminuses of the actual amino acid also have a PK. Uh, it's two and nine respectively. And they're about the same for all amino acids. Very slight differences, but you don't have to know that. Um, but yeah, so you should know three letter code, one letter code, the charge, what group it belongs to, hydrophobic, polar, uncharged, positive or negative, as well as it would be helpful to know the R group structure, but not necessarily, okay? Um, some hints to help memorize um, some of them. If you know it has, if it has acid in the name, like aspartic acid, glutamic acid, it's negative, right here. Um, um, it, these three are positive, so arginine, lysine, and histine, so you can memorize these three as a group. Um, they all have a nitrogen, so you, that's helpful to memorize. They're positive because they have a nitrogen. Um, these uh, polar ones, two of these, serine and threonine, and actually this one, tyrosine as well. If you know about kinases, um, which phosphorylate proteins. Um, they actually phosphorylate serines, threonines, and tyrosines. That's why you have phosphoserine, phosphothreonine, phosphotyrosine, because this OH group on each of them, on the ends, actually get phosphorylated and become um, PO4 groups. 
Uh, so you can memorize it that way. If you know phosphoserine, phosphothreonine, and phosphotyrosine, you know that they have an OH. Um, uh, and uh, yes, uh, and what Tim put in the chat was correct as well. And you can see with this aspartame glutamine um, in name, they're very similar to aspartic acid and glutamic acid. And you'll see, look at their structures. They're exactly the same, except aspartic acid and glutamic acid have this double bond O, O minus that makes it negative. Whereas aspartame glutamine have this double bond O, NH2, which make it neutral. Okay. Um, these special cases, cysteine is one of the only ones that has sulfur. The only other one is methionone but cysteine is the main one and it's special because it can form disulfide bonds. So uh, sulfur, sulfur, uh, sulfur and sulfur can um, bond together um, and cysteines can actually act as bonding agents. Glycine, as I mentioned, has, its R group is H. So if you were actually just to write it and ignore the H's, it just looks like a basic structure for all amino acids. Proline is special because it actually, R group makes a circle, um, a pentose ring with um, the amino terminus, which makes it a little bit special case, okay? But like I said, the best way to do this, for me at least, was flashcards. If you do it in flashcards within a day or two, you'll have most of them, a lot of information about most of them memorized if you just spend a couple of days on it, okay? And this is very, very important. The MCAT really, really likes to test these by themselves and also it's a prerequisite for a lot of other questions. Uh, Opal, you raised your hand. Uh, yeah, I kind of memorized it with just this acronym, like the GAVLIMP F. So if you know the one letter code, the G, you know, those are all the hydrophobic ones. Everything else is hydrophilic. And then from that, you only have eight amino acids to memorize. And so I put them in alcohol. The alcoholic ones are the serine and therinine, and then you go to the acidic one. So you only have six more to memorize. Then you go to the basic. His lies are basic, meaning histidine, lysine, and uh, K. Uh, histidine, lysine, and arginine, those are the basic ones. So you only have two more to memorize, or three more to memorize. And so the last two uh, would be the uh, alcohols, the basic ones, and then the acidic ones. And that's it. You got all 20 right there. So GAVLIMP, F, yeah, and then everything else, just the other eight. Uh, could you please put that actually in the chat? Because I never heard of that, and that's actually great. I wish I had that when I was memorizing that. GAVLIMP, yeah. Yeah. So, the, yeah, so anybody who actually wants to uh, memorize them, that, that seems like a good way. Um, Nina, you mentioned Anki uh, flashcards. That's how I memorize them. Um, I use the Anki flashcards. Okay. Um, and... Um, Niusha, um, you asked how we can memorize them. There's different ways. Like I said, you can like brute force it with Anki flashcards. It helps like if you're doing the brute force method, like I did. Um, some of these are, um, some people are putting in chat, like um, Tim's putting in um, family um, videos or PG. Um, that's one way. Um, I don't have the deck because I made the deck myself uh, on Anki. Um, and I used it on mobile, which I found is um, easier. Uh, whenever I study using Anki, oh, I always make my flashcards myself because that way I can, it can help me learn it faster if I made them myself. Um, Anki, it's an app. I used it on mobile. It's basically like a flashcard app. You make like a deck of flashcards on your phone. You choose what's on the front or on the back, or you can download a deck from online. Uh, or it's similar to Quizlet, yeah. Um, I liked Anki because on my phone, I could, when I was in bed or I was just too lazy to do studying like that, it was just easy to open it up five minutes, go through a deck quickly. And it really helps to memorize m over like writing something down multiple times or like reading it, like staring at this chart and trying to memorize it off this chart would be like impossible, yeah. So I would recommend flashcards, Quizlet, Anki using acronyms like um, it was shared in the chat. Um, the recording of this, I will post it. Yes, I'll post the link to the recording of this. So you guys can have a look. Oh, I, I may even actually um, share out the uh, PowerPoint as well. Okay, moving on from amino acids. Um, and somebody mentioned what kind of questions you'll be getting. 
uh, about amino acids? You'll, you'll, you'll see in this lecture, um, not this question, future questions, you'll, you'll see what kind of questions. It could be directly, what kind of amino acid is this? What is the charge? What is the PK or something like that? Or it could be like a prerequisite, like you should know it. So like it'll tell you, you'll, you'll, you'll see actually, that there are MCAT-like questions that you'll see that require you to know amino acids and their properties. But for now, um, let's look at this question. Let me see if polling works. No, okay. Yeah, I will try and fix polling for the next. <clears throat> Mark, what's uh, going with the what's going on with the poll? So um, it says you are logged in from another device. Your polling section mm. session is inactive. Oh. So it may be because we're both on the same account. Maybe next time I will oh. try and log in through a different Zoom account and we can okay. post. I think it's going now. That's weird. No. Uh, can you actually start the poll? Yeah. Uh, can you sure? Oh, you can? Okay. Can you start the poll? This is question two, yeah. Okay, great. Cool. This is like... Um... No, no, it's, it's not... Um, yeah, it's not Q1. It should be Q2. Oh, Q1, we've skipped it already. Mm, okay. Um, let's leave it like this, and then the next one we'll do question three, just because we already have votes. Okay, perfect, yeah. Yeah, it's fine. They're all the same anyway. They just have A, B, C, and D, yeah. except one of them only has two options, um, which we'll get to later, one of the questions. Uh, yeah, I, I will explain the non-polar versus polar again after this question. Yeah, remember um, Kaplan, they do something very similar, but they don't do it like, it's not as interactive um, and you have to pay like <laughs> like $2,000. <laughs> it's, it's crazy. But. Okay. It's nice. Uh, I can't, I don't have access to the poll. Um, oh yeah, could, so. Uh, yeah, could you uh, see how many people have locked in and yeah. stop the poll? Let's end the poll. Share results. Can you guys see the results? Uh, I cannot. So you, somebody would have to tell me the results. Oh, okay. So yeah, I can't see the results. Because, <laughs> uh, <laughs> could, could you uh, share them? Um, yeah. Could you just yeah so sixty-seven percent uh, said C. Okay. All right. And what was the second most popular option? Uh, Twenty-two percent said B, and mm -hmm. then eleven percent said D. Okay. All right. So that's actually uh, very good. Um, so uh, let's look at this question step by step. So which the following is most likely to be true of nonpolar R groups in aqueous solution? Aqueous solution, you know, means in water or in some kind of um, liquid. Usually, usually it's um, water, like almost always it's water. So nonpolar means the same thing as hydrophobic because polar means it has... Um, Kind of like a dipole moment. So one side is partial positive, one side is partial negative. That's what polar means. Well, if something is partial positive and partial negative, that means it has either an oxygen or a nitrogen or a fluorine or something that would interact well with water because water is polar. And you know, like like it dissolves in like, if you remember that from chemistry. So nonpolar isn't good in water. So nonpolar is the same thing as hydrophobic, which is afraid of water. So you can already eliminate A and B because it says hydrophilic, you know, it's hydrophobic. And like I mentioned, hydrophobic or nonpolar um, groups like to be found within proteins rather than on the protein surfaces um, because they don't want to interact with water at all. They, you want the hydrophilic stuff found on protein surfaces. So if it said, which of these is true of polar R groups in aqueous solution, the answer would be B. But in this case, nonpolar is C, which most of you got, which is great. All right, and the answer is C. All right, next we're gonna talk about, um, I think one of our biggest topics for today is pure, uh, protein purification and isolation 
for this, now you'll really have to use like your knowledge of amino acids and your knowledge of everything that we've covered so far to kind of like get a good under, like answer some of these questions, okay? So the major protein purification methods are SDS page, isoelectric focusing, and different types of chromatography, including affinity, size exclusion, ion exchange, and column. So uh, what is protein purification? Protein purification is when you have a solution of many different proteins and you wanna isolate one protein of interest that you care about either to study or to do whatever you want with the protein of interest. And you wanna isolate it from just a bunch of proteins, okay? Okay. So first we'll talk about chromatography. So there's, one, there's a couple of things that all forms of chromatography have in common. The major principle behind all forms of chromatography is that they have a stationary phase that binds to the protein along with a mobile phase that washes it away. So a stationary phase is one that is solid and unmoving. Like for example, a silica medium or a stationary column. A mobile phase is one that does not move and can help elute or carry the protein along with it. The mobile phase is usually a liquid which flows down the stationary phase due to gravity. So um, if, you wanna do like a real life kind of analogy. Imagine if you had like a wall and you put paint, glue and mud on the wall and then you poured water uh, onto the wall like with a hose. The mud would probably come out first, completely off the wall it would come down. Then it would probably be the paint and then it would probably be the glue or something like that. They would come elute with different times. So the mud would elute very fast because it has very weak interactions with the wall. In this case, the wall is the stationary phase, so either protein uh, silica medium or a stationary column or something like that. And the mud, glue, and paint would be the protein solutions, right? Some proteins have very strong attraction to the stationary phase or the wall. Some proteins have a weak interaction. The weaker interaction, the easier it is to wash off and the easier it is to get it out. And it just because of gravity it would come down because most are vertical, right? All right. What we measure for chromatography is the retention time of each substance or the time it takes for each substance to completely wash off the stationary phase. Meaning the longer the retention time, the longer the substance stays on the stationary phase or the wall and the stronger the, and that means the stronger the interaction it has with the wall, right? So if it has weak interaction, it would come off very fast, low retention time. Any questions about this? Let's move on. Um, see a question in chat. Okay. Um, okay. Um, well, do you know what specifically you're confused about? What do you think if we went into specifics, it would kind of clear it up? Or do you think, um, do you have any like? Okay. Um, so uh, let me see, let me try affinity chromatography, which is the first form. And let's see if you um, can understand it better. If not, I'll try and explain it a little bit further, okay? Before we move on to the other forms, okay? So in affinity chromatography, it's as the name suggests, it's based on the affinity of a protein to the wall or the stationary phase. So in affinity chromatography, the stationary phase is usually made up of a molecule that binds very specifically to a protein of interest or a modification that we made to the protein of interest. So for example, you know, um, if you studied um, immunology or um, the immune system, you know that antibodies have a very high specificity for specific target proteins. They'll only bind one protein. Each antibody will only bind one protein and it's very specific which protein it will bind. So if we use that principle, we wanna isolate one specific protein and we have the antibody for that protein, we could just line a, a wall or a column with, um, with an, that specific antibody. And we, if we put the, if we put, um, the protein th onto the, like, through the wall, we like, kind of like rinse it down, it'll stick because it'll bind to the antibody. Other ways we could do this, enzymes. Enzymes bind very well to their substrates um, or substrate substitutes in this case, because we don't want a reaction going off. So like competitive inhibitor to an enzyme would be good. It's very specific as well. Or we can genetically modify if we put a protein into a bacterium plasmid, 
and then we genetically modify it to have a, a his tag. His is one of the pro, um, amino acids. And if you have six amino, uh, if you have six histidines in a row, it's called a histamine tag. Um, histidine tag. Uh, we can use nickel. Nickel binds very well to the his tag, and this will cause when the protein that has his tag goes on the column, it'll stick to the nickel because it has very strong interaction. Okay. So once we get all of the protein of interest sticking to the column, we can use a, um, we can simply wash it with a washing buffer, which the uh, which should remove any molecules that are not interacting strongly with the column. So the washing buffer is kind of, I guess, like a weak liquid if you if you want to think about it that way. And that's not the exact proper terminology, but it will remove anything that has a weak interaction with the column. So if the antibody like is we very, very weakly bound to some other protein that we're, we don't care about, it'll get rid of it. Meanwhile, uh, if it has a strong interaction like with the protein of interest, the antibody has a strong interaction with the protein of interest, it won't wash away because it's too strong for the washing buffer. Doing this, we can ensure the, the only thing left on the column after we wash with the washing buffer is just gonna be the protein of interest down to the column, the antibody or whatever it is. Then we wash with an elution buffer, which is a liquid that has a strong interaction with the protein of interest as well. And once we do this, it'll actually break the interaction between the protein of interest and the column. When we do this, um, we ensure that, and then we collect whatever comes out with the elution buffer. And when we do this, we ensure that the, the thing we collect in our beaker after the elution buffer is just the protein of interest with the elution buffer, nothing else. All the other proteins have been gotten rid of already, right? Um, any questions about affinity chromatography? Does that make it a little bit easier to explain or do you want? Did, does anybody want any more explanation? Yeah, uh, okay, I, I can um, try and explain it a little bit further. Um, basically, in all forms of chromatography, you want to have a column, which um, actually, um, once I, I might be able to pull up a picture if you think that might help. Um, I don't think I have any pictures on my slide. Let me see. But um, the basic idea is you have a column, which is like, um, Kind of like, um, think of it like kind of like a wall, like a vertical uh, wall like this. Um, and like, think of it like a vertical wall, it goes like this, the column, my hand. You want to wash down a solution of many, many different proteins. You don't know what these proteins are. You don't know what they do. You don't know anything about them. You just know there's a bunch of them. You wash it down the uh, column, but some of these stick very well to the column because they have a very strong interaction with the actual wall itself. When this happens, and then you put water in, anything that has a weak interaction, just like if you washed off like mud off a wall, most of it would come off, but the proteins that have a very strong interaction, they would stick onto the wall, they wouldn't move. And it's not until you wash the wall with something that is very good at removing these specific stains that they would come off. And that's how you can separate it. Because the first time you wash with just water, it'll get rid of anything you don't want, and you can just discard that. Then the second time you wash with something strong, you only get the stuff that you actually want in your beaker. Um, so we always have to use a washing buffer. No, so the wa washing buffer, its main purpose in, in affinity chromatography, because this is different for each form of chromatography. This is just affinity chromatography that you use washing buffers. Uh, washing buffer, it removes everything except the protein of interest everything that's very weakly bound to the wall would be removed, like, like if you just used water. The difference in uh, this one, the previous, so the previous slide is general chromatography because there's four different forms of chromatography as I mentioned. So there's affinity, size, exclusion, ion, and column. Yeah, this is just general chromatography, like the main idea. Everyone uses like a wall, stationary phase, and a mobile phase, which is some kind of liquid or something. This is affinity chromatography, it's specific form, right? Okay. Um, Size exclusion chromatography um, is the next one. This one's very simple. So this type of chromatography has a stationary phase um, that with many small pores or holes on them. So think um, it's a wall and it has like 
potholes in it, like small potholes. So once the sol solutes are loaded in and washed with the mobile phase buffer, small proteins um, will have to go through the many small pores. So think about it, if it's kind of going down and there's many potholes, it'll get caught in the potholes and it'll take very long for it to come out. Meanwhile, large proteins that are too big to go through the pores, they'll just pass through. And because of this, sorry, uh, because that um, very large proteins will elute first. They'll come down with the water first. And if you want the large protein, if you know the protein of interest that you want is large, you'll collect what comes out first and then you'll stop collecting and the rest will go in like the trash or whatever. Meanwhile, if you want a small protein, you know the protein you want is very small, you would want to discard everything that comes out first and wait until the very end of the, like the elution comes out so that you can collect only the small proteins that had to get caught in every single pothole and had to like take a long route out of the column, right? So size exclusion bases only off size, whereas affinity is specific for one protein. Size exclusion is, uh, it eludes based off size, right? And if you know the size of your polypeptide, then you would know, you should know like roughly when it should elude from the column. And so a question using size exclusion chromatography might give you four different polypeptides and ask you which one would elute first and it would be the largest one. Next up is column chromatography. In this type of chromatography, the stationary phase is a column of silica or aluminum beads, which are polar. Uh, mainly this works based off polarity. That's how it kind of filters. Um, so like I mentioned, like dissolves in like, polar molecules will have a very strong interaction with the silica or aluminum beads. So because they're polar as well. So that means the polar molecules will kind of stick to the wall very well. Whereas nonpolar molecules, like big benzene rings, uh, hydrocarbon chains, anything like that, any of the nonpolar amino acids um, will just kind of like slide right off and they'll kind of come out first. Meanwhile, the polar uh, molecules will stick to the silica very well and they won't elute very fast because they'll be interacting and like um, mixing with the silica or aluminum beads, okay? So uh, again, if you were to ask a, if you were to give, be given a question on this and they would ask you like which elutes first and they gave you a bunch of polypeptides, the one that has the most nonpolar or hydrophobic side chains like tyrosine, uh, phenylalanine, something like that, those would elute first, whereas the polar ones, like the positive or negative ones would elute last. Okay, next one, and this one's a little bit tricky, ion exchange chromatography. So in this type of chromatography, there's a charged stationary phase. So it's either positively charged or negatively charged. Um, the wall that we're, the, the wall or the column will be going off of. A charged molecule of the same charge will pass through very fast and have a low retention time. A charged molecule of the opposite charge will be attracted to the column and pass through slowly with a high retention time. So we can see we, that kind of makes sense to us. We know that um, like charges uh, repel, whereas opposite charges attract. So um, if you were to have like a positive uh, wall, positively charged wall, positive molecules that you send through will just repel and they'll come out very fast. Meanwhile, negatively charged um, molecules that you send through will actually be attracted to the wall very much and they'll kind of stick to the wall and it'll be harder to wash them off and they'll have um, high retention time. And say opposite is true, if you had a negative wall, your negative molecules would just pass right off and pass right through, positive molecules would stick. Um, this is the part that's a little bit tricky. An anion exchange column is when the protein of interest is negative, so the column is positive. So as you may remember, anion means negative, um, but it's not the column itself that is negative, it is the protein of interest that is negative. If you have a protein of interest that is negative, you want the column to be positive so it would have a good interaction with the negative uh, molecule. A cation exchange column is when the protein of interest is positive, so the column itself is negative. Again, cation, you may remember, means positive. 
but it's not the wall itself that's positive. It's what you're looking for or the uh, protein of interest that is positive. And if you want it, the protein of interest to be positive and you want it to stick to the wall, you have to make the wall negative. So, um, yeah. Any questions about this or any of the other chromatographies that I just covered? Have, like any questions at all about anything? Oh, um, thin layer chromatography is another type of chromatography. I don't think I've ever seen uh, the MCAT test on it. It might, because um, I think it might be on the curriculum. I've never seen it in any of the practice tests I've done. It's very simple. If you know these types of chromatography, you can easily um, figure out what thin layer chromatography is if you just uh, look it up or if you remember it from your um, chemistry notes. It doesn't fall into any one of these categories. It's its own separate category. I just haven't included it because it's something that most people have done in a lab or in a class, and it's not very common on the MCAT. Um, I don't believe gas chrom. I don't think I've ever seen gas chromatography on the MCAT either. But well, these are the most common ones. These the, these four. The reason I covered that's why I covered these uh, specifically, but. If you want to learn about any other chromatography, just in case, it may be on the MCAT, um, then uh, you can always, if you understand these four and the basic principles of chromatography, when you look up any of the other ones, you should be able to figure out what's going on with those. You just have to figure out what, what is the stationary phase, what type of molecules is it attracting, what affects the retention time. So that, that's really the only thing when you look up any new type of chromatography. Next question, um, Tim, if you could start the poll. Oops, sorry. Tim, if you could start poll. And this is one of the questions I was talking about. Um, these are the one letter codes. This is not tested very often, um, but it is sometimes tested as you can see. Uh, the retention, yeah. So the re retention time is how long the molecule stays on the column for. So like I, uh, if it has a strong interaction with the wall or the column, it'll stay on for very long, retention time. Like in an I, in exchange chromatography, if, if the molecule is negative that you're testing and the wall is positive, they'll stick for, they'll have very strong attraction. It'll stick together very long, will be very hard to remove it, and it'll have a long retention time. If it's the molecule is positive, the wall is positive, very low retention time because they will repel and the molecule will literally just slide right off the column. Or, yes, not, not like slide right off, but it'll go through very fast is the point. Okay, um, this has the one letter codes as, as uh, I mentioned. Because we taught amino acids this lecture, if you don't remember them, um, go back to the other, go back to the chart if you took a picture of it or anything like that and answer it. Tim, if you could start the poll. I don't know if it's already up or not. Yeah, it's, it's already up. Okay. Um, yeah. What is this question three? Uh, Q3, yeah. Okay. Can you guys see it? Okay, yeah, you can see it. Okay, great. Yeah, so. By the way, we can't see who votes for what. We only see like the percentages broadly. Yeah, yeah, the, these polls are anonymous. We don't, we don't know who guess is what we just see at the end how many people guessed a b or c okay hmm. uh if you don't see the poll um try clicking on the bottom um on the tab there should be a polls uh, tab see if that works because if other people see it it should um yeah i mean the, the turnout is less on this one Hmm. Um. Um, see if it doesn't work. Um, if it doesn't work, then um, it's fine if you just like write it on like a notes or anything that you have, or, like piece of paper or anything like that, if you have it. Like th this is just, um, the reason I do polls is just to get an idea of um, if people understand it or not, so I can get an idea of how many people got the right answer versus the wrong answer. Yeah, I wonder if it's because it's Q3. Maybe. All right, so, yeah, 
I guess we'll uh, keep it up for another few seconds. All right. Um, okay, so 50% say C, mm -hmm. and then 33% say A. Interesting. That's actually, that's very good. Um, that's great. You guys saw that um, either, either one of, uh, actually the correct answer would be uh, C, but you, you guys um, actually saw that um, it would either be a very negative molecule like DDE, or a very positive molecule like uh, KR. It wouldn't be either of these two because they're not very negative, but they are somewhat negative. They're not positive, but they're somewhat negative because this one has one E, this one has an E and a D, which are both negative. Um, the reason it's C is because the question asks, which is most likely to be found in the first fraction? Uh, yes, these are the, these are abbreviations. These are one letter codes, the amino acids, which um, you should also have uh, memorized as well. Like I said, if you don't have it memorized now, you could have looked at the chart and it, the chart would say what the one letter code is. Um, but it says, which will likely be found in the first fraction club? It means which will come out first. If you're looking for what comes out first and you know that this is a positive uh, stationary medium, so a positive like uh, column or wall, that means a positive amino acid will come out first because it will just repel and it will just come out first. Whereas a negative one like DD, uh, GE would stick very, very tightly to the wall and it will come out last actually, right? So if the wall is positive, the first thing that come out would also be positive because it's like charges repel. Okay, and it wouldn't, it would, uh, wouldn't be this one because this one is very negative, it has three negative amino acids. Uh, D and E are the negative amino acids. Um, this one wouldn't be this one either because E and D are again the negative amino acids. I and L are both neutral amino acids. They would not contribute one way or the other. C, K, and R are both positive. V, e, v G, and P are both neutral while E is negative. So this is very slightly negative, but it still would stick better than positive. They are in the amino acid chart, yes. It's the, if you're looking at the chart I posted, it's um, in the red circles and it's the first letter code. So it's in the red circles, white letter. Um, so yeah, D and E are, um, they're negative. They're the, the uh, spartic acid, glutamic acid. They're the two negative amino acids. All right. And I actually have another question. This is one of the questions that I made. It's, it's not a quite MCAT style question, but just to make sure you guys understand this. Uh, this is the only one that matters. Um, Tim, if you could put Q4, because it only has two options. Yes. Question four. Oh, that's weird. Uh, why does Q4 have two options? Because this one is, is this anion or cation exchange? It only has two options, that's why. Uh, okay. I'll, I'll go back and look at the amino acid chart at the end. Uh, after this question, we do it. This always got me. It's a little tricky. It's, it's all about like your reference, like what is actually being collected. Mm -hmm. Or what do you consider being collected? Is it the solution or is it in the column? That's, that was my slight um, stumble with it, but it's good to, to get it, do it now, get it wrong and then figure yeah. it out before the test. Okay, so we're split 50-50. Okay, um, it's not, okay, that, that, that's good. Um, exactly, eight responses and eight responses. <laughs> okay. So the, actually the correct answer is anion exchange because I know it says net positive charge, which you may think is means cation, but read what is positive. It's the stationary medium. So the column and the wall is positive. Remember when I said this one's a little bit tricky because 
cation and anion don't refer to the wall itself. It, they refer to the molecule or the protein of interest that the wall is meant to attract. If the wall is positive, that means it's meant to attract a negative molecule. So like uh, D or E. Then it would be uh, anion exchange because it's meant to attract a negative molecule like an anion. If it was, if the wall had a net negative charge, then it'd be cation exchange because then it would be trying to attract uh, and the protein of interest would be positive, right? Does that make sense? Or do you want me to go over that again? Yeah. Um, the idea is that anion and cation exchange don't refer to the charge on the wall. It refers to the charge of the protein of interest that you're looking for that is supposed to stick to the wall. Uh, there's, any, there's, it, it gets very convoluted and with, yeah. with these positive, negative, then you do like, like, um, the, uh, what's it called? The, like the plate, um, I forget what it's called, but you know, you have like the anode and cathode and then in that yes, sense, yes. the anode is positive, um, and the cathode is negative. Actually, um, we're, we're actually coming on to that next. Yeah. Next up is electro, uh, isoelectric point focusing. Yes. This one ties a little bit into um, the last one. You'll see how they work together in the end, but it's also its own thing. So every protein has a, an isoelectric point or a PI in which the protein is perfectly neutral. So this means that all the positive charges and all the negative charges on the protein or on the polypeptide must cancel out, including the C and N terminus, remember, because the N terminus is at pH seven is usually positive and at pH seven, the, the C terminus is negative, as you can see in this picture. Um, the C terminus on, on the right end is negative, and the N terminus on the left end is positive. And so at pH seven, they usually cancel out. Um, oh, uh, actually, um, I'm sorry. Uh, before I continue this, I actually promised I would go back and look at the chart. Um, if you see um, arginine, under the name, under the word arginine, it says ARG, and then right next to it, it has a red circle with an R on it, and then that's the one-letter code for arginine is R. Histidine, under that, it says his, and then right next to it, red circle, it says H, which is the one-letter code for that. So do, do you see the chart, um, Niusha? Yeah, so th those like red circles, th those are the one letter code. And the like ARG, HIS, those are the three letter codes. Sorry, um, I, I just promised I would go back to that uh, after the question. No problem. Um, so what I was saying was, um, so at pH seven, the, the N terminus and C terminus would cancel out, one positive or negative, it would be neutral. But if you have charged uh, amino acids like say D or E, which are negatively charged, or um, arginine, lysine, uh, histine, which are positively charged, um, you would actually shift the balance of the polypeptide. In order to make it neutral, then you would have to either deprotonate it or protonate the, um, those amino acids, those residues. So as you can see um, on the picture here, uh, you have um, tyrosine, which is neutral, even though it's orange circle with OH. It, OH will like pretty much never be deprotonated. It's um, very hard to um, deprotonate it. It'll always be um, OH uh, under like normal human conditions. Um, however, if you see in the purple box, there is um, arginine. And arginine is under normal conditions positive. So as you can see, there's a little plus on it. And at the bottom net charge, it says minus plus zero plus. So overall charge is plus one. So the way you get something to become neutral from this stage is you would have to increase the pH. You'd have to increase the pH so much that the surrounding environment is now more basic or higher pH than the pKa value of the purple boxed arginine to make sure that arginine actually gets um, deprotonated and it becomes neutral and that and then the positive will become a, a zero a neutral and the whole molecule will be neutral. So this this is why it's important to learn the pKa's of each charged amino acid 
I put them all here so you don't have to go back. For the C-terminus, it's about two. Asparagine and glutamine, the two negative amino acids, it's about three, uh, three to four. For the N-terminus, um, it's 10. Lysine is also about 10. Arginine is about 12. Histidine is about six. Um, and this is a, a little bit of a hint. Protonated means it has an extra proton. So if you think of an acid, so let's say um, HCl, if that's like most common acid, HCl is the protonated version of the, the molecule because it has a proton, which is hydrogen. Hydrogen is a proton. Um, if you want to deprotonate it, remove the proton, it becomes Cl minus. You know that when an acid, an acid under um, most definitions wants to give up its um, proton, it wants to give up its hydrogen. If it wants to give up its hydrogen, then it becomes Cl minus deprotonated. So under most situations, it want to be deprotonated. But when it becomes, a, the environment becomes acidic enough, it'll actually revert back to HCl. In at like normal human pH, like pH seven, um, HCl would not be HCl, it would be um, usually Cl minus. That, that's what, and it would be in the deprotonated form, right? Meanwhile, like a base like um, NH3 plus, which um, is a common base um, in organic um, compounds, um, NH3 plus is the protonated form because it has, a, has an extra proton. Meanwhile, if it gets if the environment gets basic enough, if the pH gets high enough, it'll deprotonate. The NH3 plus will go into NH2 neutral. It'll lose its hydrogen and it'll become deprotonated. So the general rule is, uh, so it's located in an acidic environment, uh, it uh, wants to lose its proton. So yes, yes. So whatever, so whenever you're looking at a molecule, either acid or base, you're looking at it relative to its environment. So the pH of the environment. If an acid, wh whichever of the two, the, the molecule or the environment is most acidic, that's what will kind of want to give up its H. If one thing gives up its H, that means the other thing has to accept the H. If the environment is more acidic than the molecule, the environment will give an H plus to the molecule and the molecule will become protonated. If the molecule is more acidic than the environment, then it'll give up, it'll give up its H and it'll become deprotonated and the environment will get an extra H. Um, and that, that works for both acids and bases. So at some, if the pH gets high enough, eventually um, NH3 plus, which is a pretty good base, will actually become more acidic than the environment and it will actually act as an acid and give up its NH3 plus it'll give up its H and become NH2 plus. It'll, because it'll be more acidic than the environment, which is heavily basic, okay? The rule for that is if the pH is greater than the pKa, then the molecule is deprotonated. Otherwise, if the pKa is higher than the pH, then it is protonated, okay? Any, any other questions about that before we move on? So, okay, uh, pKa is kind of the, pKa is the pH where, if you, if you want to think about it this way for at least for this lecture, which we'll cover, when we cover acid base more, we'll get more into pKa. But if you want to think about it for, for this lecture at least, pKa is basically the transition point between protonated and deprotonated. When you reach the pKa, it, it, it's the transition point. It's where it transitions from protonated to deprotonated or deprotonated to protonated, depending on the starting point and the end point like which way your pH is rising or going down, going up or going down. So the pKa is like the, the transition point of the pH. So when the pH crosses the pKa, a transition occurs. If that, if that makes sense. Uh, like I said, we'll get more into uh, pKa and acid base when we cover acid bases, I believe in two or three weeks. Yeah, but for now, think of it as like the transition point. And, um, this is the next question I want to ask you, which actually might make the game a little bit more clear. Let's do the poll. Question four. Uh, yeah. Question five. Yeah, at this point, it doesn't matter. Yeah. They're, they all have like four options. Okay. Uh, 
Yeah, this is important stuff. It's good. All right, votes are coming in. Eight of 22 people voted. Yes, uh, we can wait uh, another minute or two. Um, just let people get their votes in. Yeah, um, I think we should like, wrap it up a little bit. Yeah. Okay, so we have a pretty even split down the middle, uh, like through all four. So, okay. all right, 30% say D. Oh, now people are changing. 27% say D, 27% say C, 27% say B, and 18% say A. Well, um, okay. <laughs> Okay, so uh, I'll, I'll go over this one a little bit um, better. I, I did kind of expect this. The correct answer is um, B. So, um, like it's I mentioned, tricky, guys. yeah, if pH is greater than pK, then it's deprotonated. Otherwise, it's protonated. Just remember that rule. So, we're looking at pH equals 5. At pH equals 5, this uh, pK, uh, and you, look, you have to look at the pKs. NH3 plus is still protonated. Uh, oh, and the C terminus is still deprotonated. So that's one positive on the left, one negative on the right, neutral so far. Then you have um, this, which is aspartic acid. It should be a pKa of four, which is less than the, PKA, the pH of five. So it's again, deprotonated, negative, one negative on the left. Then you have uh, this, which is lysine, pKa of 10.5. Then you have, uh, which means it's protonated, which means it's positive, neutral, one negative, one positive, neutral. You have to look at these two, which are the same thing. It's uh, histidine. These have a pKa of 6.04. Now, I know on this picture, it doesn't um, have a positive or negative uh, charge. It has a neutral charge. That, that's a trick. The MCAT will trick you like this. They will not include all of the charges. They will include, they will give you one form, possible form of the amino acid. This does not mean that it's neutral because the pKa is actually uh, greater than the pH, meaning it actually becomes protonated. Meaning, in the, it's not this NH in the bottom right that, that's the protonated form. It's actually the NH, it's actually the N that has the double bond on it. It actually gets another proton becoming NH plus with the double bond. Meaning that both of these two histidines are positive, meaning that the answer is B, because there's no negative to cancel them out and all the other positive negatives cancel out, okay? Is that uh, clear? Okay, so do you get why um, the N-terminus, C-terminus, um, spartic acid and lysine cancel out, the, the ones that already have the charges written on them, like drawn on them on this figure? Because they, they are in their correct forms yeah, do you understand that, uh, Niusha? Yeah, okay. Now with histidine, 
firstly, you know that histidine is um, kind of like a, a positive molecule because it's one of the positive molecules rather than one of the negative ones. It doesn't have acid in the name, so it can't be negative. Um, meaning when it's protonated, it becomes positive. So you see there's an NH on it, right? But this NH isn't where the protonation deprotonation occurs in the bottom right of the molecule, in the bottom right of the ring. That NH has nothing to do with the protonation deprotonation. It's the N with the double bond on the left side of the ring that, that gets protonated deprotonated. Because the pKa is six, which is uh, greater than the pH of five, meaning that N would actually uh, at this pH should be protonated, it should be B. Because this would be plus one, protonated, NH plus, NH plus, plus one, plus one, plus two. Does that make more sense? Yeah. In, in a way, again, like if you want to think about it, like uh, if you want to think through it, if, if the pKa is six, and the pH is five, that means the pH is more acidic than um, the histidine. If, if the environment is more acidic, that means the environment will end up giving its H plus to the histidine and the histidine will accept the H plus as like a base. And it'll act as a base and it'll accept the H plus and that's where it'll accept it in the N. Yeah, okay. Um, and these are the um, names of the amino acids if you wanted to look at it. Okay, this is a pretty complicated slide, how isoelectric focusing works. So for now, we've been just talking about isoelectric point, which is the property of the amino acids. Now we're gonna look at the actual test, how we can use this property to purify and identify uh, proteins. Um, so first thing we do is we create a gradient of an acidic positive anode on the left and a basic negative cathode on the right with a neutral area in the middle. Uh, once you create an electric field, positive ions will go towards the negative cathode, obviously positive migrates towards negative and negative migrates towards positive. Once it reaches a point where it becomes neutral, it stops at that pH. So it won't go all the way to, it usually won't go all the way to either the, po the positive or negative end it'll stop somewhere before it reaches that point. And that's the point where it changes from positive to neutral or negative to neutral. For a single amino acid, if we're just looking at one amino acid, the area where it stops is exactly where its pKa is. Because like I mentioned, pKa is the transition from protonation, deprotonation, depending on which way you look at it. So the pH at which the amino acid will stop is its pKa value, okay? it'll stop the transition point where it first transitions and then that's it. It won't go any further because it's already neutral. For a polypeptide, the general idea is the same, except you have to find out how many protonation or deprotonation events it must undergo to become neutral. So for example, with this one, it's plus two. So that means it must undergo two deprotonation events to become neutral in order to, it has to lose its first proton, become plus one, then it has to lose another one, become zero. In this case, the peak, it'll still be at a pKa of about six because the two positive molecules are actually the same. It's just two histidines. But at pKa, but if it were two different amino acids um, that were causing it to become plus two, then it would be not the first pKa, it would be the second pKa value. Okay. Um, sorry, uh, there's a question in the chat. Okay, never mind. Um, maybe explain. Okay. Yeah, and terminus um, under neutral pH, under neutral pH of seven in like the human body, N terminus is always protonated, C terminus is de always deprotonated. But like I mentioned, um, N terminus has a pKa value of 10, C terminus has a pKa value of about two. If you go to acidic uh, value of like one, the C terminus will become protonated. It will become COOH. If you go to pH value of 11, and terminus will become deprotonated, become an H2. Okay. This is actually what Tim was talking about with the anode and cathode being actually opposite of what they are in a uh, galvanic cell, which may be where you've heard those words before. Um, the way you can remember this, because the MCAT may sometimes ask 
um, where will this polypeptide like go towards? Will it go towards the anode or will it go towards the cathode? They may ask that question. Um, the way you remember that is uh, you remember the, hopefully you know the, like the acronym um, ANOX and RADCAT, reduction at the cathode, oxidation at the anode. This is always true, no matter galvanic cell or in this case. And so you can think about it that way. If you have a positive molecule, like say uh, lysine, if you put it in the middle, it would want to go toward, it would want to become neutral in order to become neutral it would have to be reduced because reduction is making something more negative. If you're positive to make more negative would make you neutral. If you are, so it would want to be reduced. So it would go to the cathode and the cathode must then be negative. Otherwise, if you put in something like aspartic acid, something that's negative, it'd want to be oxidized because to oxidize is to make something more positive and to make a negative molecule more positive is to make it neutral. Where, would, where does oxidation occur? at the anode. So it migrates towards the anode. If the negative molecule is migrating towards the anode, that means the anode must be positive as well. That's how you remember it. If you don't like want to remember this like fully, memorize it, that's how you could easily um, uh, like reach that conclusion on the test. And that's how I did it when I got this question actually on my MCAT. Um, any questions about that? I see some things in the chat. Okay. So um, do you remember red cat and anox? Um, the reduction happens at, okay. Remember those two words, red cat and ox. Red, reduction happens at the cathode. Oxidation happens at the anode, always. And that's in galvanic cells and the electrochemistry stuff. And that's in this case scenario, it's always. And uh, at the anode, always oxidation. At the cathode, always reduction. The, the charge of the anode and cathode may change. So in galvanic cells, it's actually opposite to, the, to this charge. Um, yeah. And so if you know that, and you remember that reduction is making something more negative, oxidation is making something less negative or more positive. Um, if you put a positive molecule, you'll know that it wants to get reduced because positive molecule would want to become, like would become neutral so it would um, be reduced because it would become more negative, which is neutral. If it wants to be reduced, it would ha have to happen at the cathode. Reduction always happens at the cathode. So it would always migrate towards the cathode. And then you can remember, well, if, if the positive molecule is going towards the cathode, that means the cathode must be negative because opposites attract. Otherwise, negative molecule wants to get oxidized to become neutral, always happens at the anode, anode must be positive to attract a negative molecule. That's how you remember it. Because the MCAT, they might ask you, which way does this molecule go? And it's not just the positive end or the negative end, it would be towards the anode or towards the cathode. Because I've actually had that question on the MCAT. Okay. Um, all right, any other questions about this? The key, the key is, um, for isoelectric point, the point where it stops is it's equal to its pKa usually. It's roughly where the pKa of the molecule is. And from if you know the pKa of a molecule, you can know what amino acid it is because you know what amino acids are, have which pKa's on the test day, hopefully. Um, so here's another question. Which molecule, yeah, yeah, it's the amino acid chart. Um, D and E are negative and uh, lysine, arginine, histine are positive. It's the same amino acid chart. Like I said, the key of biochemistry is you have to know the amino acids and their properties. That's so true. Yeah, and you're seeing again in this question, yeah. Okay. Again, the, the, all these, most of these questions uh, I'm giving are MCAT-like questions that I found online from um, MCAT prep sources. So um, this is similar to what you would, these questions are similar to what you would actually see on an MCAT. So question number six. Yeah. Q6 in progress. Can you guys see it?
Okay. Uh, yeah, we're, we're, almost, we're almost done, guys. There's not um, that many slides left. So, and I know this is a lot of um, information that I threw at you guys today. I'm just trying to get as much information as possible across because we don't have too much time, um, too many weeks. And I'm also a full-time student, so I'm a little bit busy as well during the week. So I want to get you guys as much information as possible. Eight week program. Once we do the 15 week program, we'll have three yeah. sessions a week. Yeah, well, once we do the 15 week, um, it'll be a lot clearer. There'll be a lot more, like, uh, it'll be a lot better. Yeah. So, like, when we do the 15 week, we could probably do um, maybe even assets and bases before this stuff. Yes. Yeah. yeah. There'll be a lot more. Um, each specific topic will get its own category. So, you're not learning. A lot of stuff for the first time hopefully when you reach this lecture yeah okay, okay. um so so far we have 38 percent for b 25 mm percent -hmm. for c and 38 percent for d okay so. that's uh okay that's not too bad um so uh the correct answer as you can see is d um the reason uh, for that is, so you know the solution is at pH 4. Form isoelectric um, on these amino acids. Which would you uh, order the amino acids in terms of migration distance from greatest smallest? So what's the difference between where it stops and where it started? If it starts at pH 4, which would kind of go f the furthest away from pH 4? It would obviously, uh, it would be lysine because like I mentioned, for a singular amino acid in an isoelectric focusing, the pH, that the area where it stops correlates to its pKa value. Lysine has the highest pKa value of, I think, 10 or 12. Uh, histine has the second highest of six, so it would move about, uh, it would move a little bit, but not as much. Spartate, um, aspartate is aspartic acid, um, just so you know. Aspartate and glutamate are aspartic acid and glutamic acid. It's just in their protonated forms. How do you, uh, their PK, it's on the chart. It, again, it would have to be something you would have to memorize. It, yeah. it's, it's on the chart. Yeah, you'd have to memorize that. Or I put it actually in um, a list. I put it on the list with the PK values for each amino acid are, along with the N-terms and C-numbers. But um, so lysine would migrate the farthest because it's the biggest difference between PK and start point. Histine, smaller difference. Aspartate, the PK value is about three to four, the smallest distance. So that's how they would travel. Like Sparta would basically stick with where it is. Whereas Lysine would have to go very long distance. Um, before we continue this question, let me just show you quickly if you want to take a picture. Here are the amino here are the PKs of all the amino acids. Uh, quickly take this picture if you want. Screenshot. Okay, and moving on. Now this is like I mentioned, um, like I mentioned, uh, isoelectric point and cation exchange and ion exchange, they're very linked. On an MCAT, they may very well ask something like this, where they link the two uh, tests. So you have to know both of them and how they work together. So um, let's see if you can, you guys can get this one. Poll is launched. Question seven. Mm -hmm.
Hey, Mark, um, we're doing office hours on Saturdays at 12? Uh, yes. Does that work for you? Yeah, yeah, that works. So, um, yeah, I'll, I'll cover that at the end of the lecture. But, yeah, we will be having office hours about, um, preferably about this topic that we covered today. But, really, if, if you have any other questions about anything biochemistry or biology-related, you can bring those in. Um, they'll be more, like, hopefully individualized. Uh, somebody would come in with a question about a topic or um, – a MCAT question that they had trouble with, and I would answer them and go over them with you. Yeah, next week's lecture will be, I believe, about general chemistry, I think, is what we have scheduled, yeah, but yeah. Reactions and solutions, I think. Yeah. It'll be equilibrium, reaction solutions, concentrations, things like that. Yeah. Okay. So we have five, uh, oh, 83% of people saying B, 17% saying so that's actually very good very nice um, so from the start you can narrow down to two choices um, yeah, you know in a cation exchange it goes by um, it goes by uh, charge and same thing with um, isoelectric goes by charge so without even looking at anything you know it, it goes from either peptide 4 peptide 2 peptide 3 peptide 1 either from right to left or it would go from left to right one, three, two, four. So if you really didn't know anything, you, you could make a guess between these two really, um, realistically. So at least gives you a 50-50 chance if you really don't know the answer. But uh, we see that, like I said, where peptide stops correlates to its pKa. The pKa, uh, so the rightmost one, peptide four, the pKa would correlate to uh, a very acidic amino acid. So aspartic acid, glutamic acid, something like that. And then it would go more basic, more basic, more basic as you go left. Something that's acidic means that it's negative uh, at nor uh, normal pH, which is pH 7. As you go, f uh, so if it's uh, negative, it would. Cation exchange means that the, um, the, again, cation exchange means that the wall is negative and the protein of interest is positive. If the wall is negative, something that's negative would elute very fast, meaning peptide 4 would elute first followed by two, three, one. And one would stick the best because it's positive, the most positive. Last thing I want to touch on uh, very briefly, because um, it's not too uh, big, SDS page, which I'm sure some of you actually have done in a lab probably uh, in undergraduate in one of your bio or chem classes. Um, so SDS, sodium dodecyl sulfate, that's how you say it, is a detergent that is used to wash the protein. So it's literally like a wash for a protein. It coats the entire protein with a net negative charge and it denatures it. Denaturing means that um, it makes uh, the protein linear since all intramolecular bonds are like hydrogen bonds, disulfide bonds are broken. So if you've ever seen um, a protein in like a diagram or anything, it's not like a linear, like we, we like write it on a piece of paper, like a linear chain, like polypeptide. It's actually like folded heavily, which uh, we'll cover at a different time. But what SDS does is it makes it back to its linear form, denaturing it. And it also coats the whole thing with a negative charge. Because the proteins, you don't know what charge it has, positive, negative, neutral, whatever. You, it's kind of hard to, yeah. It, it's harder to do like a regular page experiment, polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis, because um, a basic uh, page experiment um, separates them based off both size and charge. So it's two variables, which is not as good. If you coat it with a negative charge, everything with a negative charge, then it removes one variable because you're setting it all equal. So really, it only separates now by size when you run SDS page, when you treat uh, the protein with SDS first and then run um, page experiment. What is a page experiment? So um, it's a polyacrylamide gel is a 
like a block of gel and it has different like columns and you put the pipette uh, protein into each column uh, down and then you run a current through the gel uh, which contains all the SDS watch proteins along with a standard. So molecules that are larger like pro like large proteins will move down uh, will move down the gel slower while ones that are small will move to the bottom of the gel fast. So I can show you a picture of this, what this looks like. So this is what an actual completed uh, SES page experiment looks like. So on the left, the first column, the M column is the standard, which has all of the sizes, all of, like the known sizes, we, we know what's in this. And uh, it's left you have the KDA, which is kilodaltons, which is the unit of measurement for protein sizes. And you can see the top has the highest, largest size, bottom has the smallest, lowest size. And then each uh, protein in each of the wells, one, two, three, four, and five, in each of the columns, it has one protein. So it's already, the protein has hopefully already been purified using either chromatography or uh, something else, has already been uh, purified. And then you're just trying to make sure that this protein actually has been purified. That, that's the main use of SDS page. Um, and you can see what the size of the protein is. So in column one, the size is 34 kilodaltons, the protein, same thing with two. Three is a little bit bigger, four is bigger, five is bigger. Uh, this is what it should look like. Um, if you see column three, it has slight like um, marks other than the big uh, well at 43. This means that either the SES page wasn't perfect or that the protein that was purified wasn't completely purified and there's small traces of other proteins of different sizes. This is unavoidable because you can't do a perfect experiment usually. This is a very good experiment at least, um, even with a little bit of um, inaccuracy. Um, so if something like this ever shows up on the MCAT in one of the passages um, as a picture, you would be able to, you should be able to analyze it. Uh, as a note, in SDS page, small proteins move faster down than larger. So in the beginning, everything starts on the top. And then as the time goes on, it usually should take like an hour or two. It moves down to, and like finally rests at like a final location. Um, small proteins move much faster down than large ones. Um, so large ones will be at the top, small ones will be at the bottom. This is the exact opposite of what it is in size exclusion chromatography. In size exclusion chromatography, the small ones get caught in all the potholes, so they move down slower. Large ones skip all the potholes and they just go down straight away. Uh, gel electrophoresis, exact opposite. That's a little bit annoying, but you just have to remember that. All right. Final thoughts, this is the last slide. Um, one thing I, should, I think you should um, you guys should all do is memorize the amino acids, including full name, three letter code, PK, and the polarity, polar, nonpolar, charged, or non-charged. One letter code and full R group structure are recommended as well. But like I said, the, the first couple are more important. One letter code may be important as you saw there was one question on it that I posted. Um, I, you really should understand how peptides bonds form to make polypeptide chains. Uh, understanding the mechanism may be helpful, but requires some organic chemistry knowledge like nucleophilic and um, electrophilic. Um, so I'm not, that's why I didn't go over it today. And I don't um, think it's that important. Um, understand the different forms of chromatography, mainly what the stationary phase is and what retention time depends on for each. Like I mentioned, if you understand the general ideas of chromatography, if you look up any other chromatography, like thin layer, gas, whatever, you should, you would, this is what you would look for. What is the stationary phase? What does the retention time depend on? And you'd be able to understand it. That's also maybe important because in the MCAT, they might not ask for you to know what a gas exchange, or gas chromatography thin layer is, but they may uh, describe it in a passage and then ask you about it. So they are giving you the information, but then they ask you about it and you could use um, your understanding of chromatography is answer that. Okay, lastly, you should understand isoelectric point and how it can work together with ion exchange chromatography. Like you saw, some questions use both, so you should understand them both separately, but also how they can work together um, in an experiment, okay? Um,
I am going to cover more biochem probably in the full course, the 15 week. I don't think I'm going to get a chance to cover more biochem in this eight week. We only have eight lectures. There's four MCAT um, topics, well, four MCAT sections. Each one has multiple topics. I have to cover chemistry. I have to cover physics. I have to cover um, cars, psych, everything like that. I might not have enough time for another biochem, but if you do have a biochem question that's more specific or more in-depth than this, feel free to come to office hours on Saturdays and uh, ask me then. And I will hopefully be able to answer that because I took biochem recently, so I should have, um, even without prep, I should um, remember most of it. Yeah, so. Yeah, yeah, this is great. Um, any book? Um, I personally used Berkeley Review. Mark used Kaplan. <laughs> I personally bought the Kaplan book. Uh, it's not that it's not that expensive. It's only like hundred fifty dollars. They gave a lot of practice tests. More than books, I would highly recommend getting some subscription or something to a test bank. U World, Kaplan, anything. Practice questions way better than just like doing content review. As long as you at least know some content. If if, if when you once you feel comfortable with some content. Practice questions will give you a lot more bang for your buck than doing more content review. Yeah. So if you want, if you like understand, um, uh, sure. Yeah, so the, the nice thing with Berkeley review is when you're doing your content review, you're also doing practice passages. So um, after you do your, your review, you go straight into practice passages that same day. So you kind of reinforce it. And those passages are very are specific to the concepts that you, the content that you just learned. Um, yeah, yeah, like Prince Interview, another one. The books usually come with uh, questions in them, and they also can give you online access to practice tests. That's how I did it. Um, they're not that expensive. Like I said, M uh, Kaplan, which is one of the more expensive ones, actually, uh, it was like two hundred dollars, three hundred dollars. Um, the U World, I think, is uh, Tim would have a better idea. It's oh cheaper. yeah, we have a discount. We we, and we also have up a with U World. yeah we we also have a discount with the U World actually. Um, but yeah, I just I knew like the price is like the back of my hand, but I think you can get it for like two hundred bucks with us yeah. or something. Yeah, we don't make we'll, any money off it. We just yeah we give we give, it, we give a discount. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's like a yeah. Um, I would, U World. I've I've heard good things. I haven't used it personally. I've heard good things. Uh, I know it's a big question bank, as most of the questions. I prefer, w once you have a basic understanding of uh, the content, if you don't know any content, doing questions is useless because you're not going to understand anything. But if you have a, a good grasp on like the major uh, concepts, like introduction to biochemistry, proteins, DNA, what is it, like all of that stuff, once you have a general grasp on the highest yield content, questions will be better than doing specific, than like doing more content review. It's a discount code. Uh, Tim, you would know more about that. Oh, um, yeah. Just, um, if, yeah, if you email us, um, you would need to email your PayPal. Email us your name. I'll, I'll put it in the chat, but email us your name, your PayPal username, and then we will send um, the price to you. And um, yeah, let me, let me do that right now. Let me get the yeah, uh, you did. Uh, which books do I recommend for just reading content? Honestly, I did Kaplan. Honestly, they gave me seven books. I, I opened three of them. I didn't even touch the other four. Um, <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> uh, really, um, Kaplan's fine. It was fine. Yeah. The bo books have, it's just going over what, what you learned in your lectures in during the prereq classes, like physics, biochemistry. Um, so it, it, it's not, it's not that bad. Um, it, it gets the job done. Really, you, you should like, um, yeah, Ka Kaplan should be fine. I'm not sure what next step is. Tim, do you know? Oh, what's next that? Step? Next step. So SMS oh, how much it is? Oh, uh, yeah. Oh, next step, um, full lengths are there. The way that they ask questions is okay. What what it is is everyone uses next steps, so they're able to create a nice, accurate um, representation of premeds, and so you can get a fairly accurate 
score from their tests just because they are able to like mimic like the curve just because they have such a large data pool of students. And so typically what you, what you get on next step exams are pretty reflective of what you would likely get on the AMC real deal test. For well, what I used for instead of next step, um, I, that, I didn't know about that actually, that would have been helpful, but I used the official AMC full length test which are on their site. I would not recommend doing those right now um, unless you're feeling very confident. Those I would recommend doing once you have, once you feel like you have most of the content mastered, you will yeah. have a good understanding of most of the content. Cause when you take those tests, you'll realize you don't, you don't have all the content mastered and you'll find what you are not comfortable with. It'll be more helpful than if you took them now. And if you, at least if you don't have full understanding, um, if you took them now and you got a lot of questions wrong, perform poorly, and then you would have to so much stuff to like relearn that you would not be able to make full use of it. I have a question. Go ahead. Of course. Um, I got the AMC package bundle or whatever. Um, they have like the four exams and then they have, mm -hmm. the, I think the diagnostic test. Um, mm -hmm. I literally just started like, um, studying, should I take the diagnostic test now or wait until I get a little bit of content and uh, before doing that? I waited until I got more content when I started the AMC stuff. Um, you could do the diagnostic. I would, I would wait. Um, depends how confident you're feeling. I didn't touch practice exams until I felt like I, like I, I told you I did uh, three of the seven books. I did all four, all like, I went through the three books that I knew like physics, psych and biology the, those are the sections that i like forgot from classes went through those fully then i did the tests and then once i did the test i found more like um areas that i wasn't comfortable in they're like low yield stuff and then i was able to just like do small areas small areas from each test get get like um low yield stuff that's how i would do it um you can try the diagnostic test you still have four more exams uh to do afterwards yeah um also, guys, um, let me put my books. personal email to. Um, Niyusha, like I mentioned, um, for practice um, questions, AMCAT, UWorld, um, they mentioned Blueprint. Um, you could do Kaplan. Cap Kaplan, I've heard not so great things about Kaplan, even though I did it, because, the, and I found this as well, their, their questions and exams are actually harder than the AMCAT. When I was doing that, I scored much lower on their exams that I did when I took AMC. It was like a big, like 15 point jump, even though I had, it was like a one day difference. I would, didn't learn that much from it. Like in that one day. Point. Wow. Yeah. So like on the, on the, on the, on the Kaplan MK, I got like a five, eight. I did really bad. Then like two days later I did a AMC and I got like a five seventeen on it. It's cause it was a big difference. So their, their exams really are like hard, like Kaplan. The questions are really hard. Yeah, they're 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 hard, and they're like harder than like the MCAT would ever ask you. I I tried doing their question bank as well, and their question bank it was uh, it was even harder than their practice exams. I didn't I still don't know most of it, even though I got a five twenty. I've never seen those questions on the <laughs> proper MCAT ever. Altius. Um... I don't I don't know most of these. Mo I guess I'm big I think I did one of theirs. I, honestly, at times I just did like brute force and I was just doing like a full length every other day. And so whatever I could get my hands on, I just did. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, no, any test you take will not hurt you. Any test you take will help you from any company. Kaplan, Altius, Blueprint, AMC, everything. Anything will help you. Yeah. The, they're, like, there's a reason that they are called MCAT prep. It's because they're at least somewhat more or less close to the MCAT. Everything will everything will help you. Whatever you have access to, whatever is like the best price, most questions, that's what I would recommend. Uh, would it be better to take the calculus-based physics for the MCAT? Um, I don't know what the difference is. That depends on your school. Um, the name test you recommend? Um, I would recommend. Definitely AMC, but that should be your last step. Those are like, that's the closest you can ever get to an MCAT because that is old MCATs. It's the actual company that makes the MCAT. So 
definitely them, but I would recommend them at the end when you're right before, like when you're like two weeks from exam. Yeah, Tim would have a better idea. Um, as for like calculus-based physics or algebra-based physics, I don't know what the difference is because it depends on your school. Um, I think I think it's a calculus-based physics. I don't know what algebra-based physics is about. I think algebra is the algebra one is probably more is it's going to be more similar to the actual MCAT. Probably, well, most likely, yes. So, uh, it's about whatever uh, goes between. Yes, uh, Ernestine, I, I agree with that. Um, it's basically whatever, whatever. There are some are better than others, of course, but. Uh, full length tests, I think I did um, two weeks of full lengths almost every day. So I think I did about <laughs> seven or eight total in the two weeks leading up to the exam. Four of them, five of them are actually um, AMC. I think two or three of them were Kaplan. Wow. But after, after I did badly on the two Kaplan ones, I just gave up on that. Yeah, I usually say like I did an exam like every other day and people, yeah. like I've never seen someone else do that, but it sounds like you were doing them every day. So I, I did them like one day and then one day I would spend on um, the topic I did worst on. So like if I did yeah. like bad on like psych, I would spend a day just looking at, um, looking over the test and looking at different psych practice questions. Like yeah, that's what I did. And then, the, and then the de next day you go back into <laughs> to another practice. Yeah. Um, MCAT is more, there's not much math. Um, you, you know how to do logs, you know how to do exponents, you know how to do all the math on MCAT, I think. Physics is a little bit of math. You know how to multiply, I'm, just, I'm assuming, hopefully. Yeah, you'll want to get fast with math, but. No calculators, yeah. Yeah, no calculators. Yeah, you learn how to do logs in your head. So I don't know if you guys have Clubhouse, if you guys have Clubhouse downloaded, but um, sometimes I hop on Clubhouse and I just do like rooms with students and, and I talk about all this stuff um, for like an hour because you can go like all day. Um, yeah. uh, all right, I'm gonna answer a couple more questions and I'm gonna uh, head off. Uh, so sociology is included in the MCAT, probably actually just as much if not bigger than so psychology I found. Um, Shame because I didn't know any. I didn't have a success sociology class. So, but um, I did study full time. Uh, um, someone asked. I did study full time. It was during winter break. So as soon as my finals ended, I think in December sixteenth, from December sixteenth to January sixteenth, just full time, no job, no classes, nothing. Full on cat, start to finish. I would, I would recommend doing it full time. Doing it, juggling it with schoolwork is going to be kind of hard. You're not going to get as much out of it. If you can, of course, during winter break, summer break, something like that, find, find like a month, two months to full time study if you can. Okay. Um, I think that's all. Um, it's everything we've been going for like two, over two hours. Yeah, it's a long session. Yeah, so we'll, I think we'll we're going to call it. Um, it will, the recording will be up if you guys want to go back. If you want to go like two times speed, half time speed, pause, whatever. We'll see you Saturday, uh, 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. M, uh, office hours next Sunday is chemistry. So also Sunday, 12 p.m. All right. Thank see you. you later, everyone.